Amen. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit this morning. Do we need the Holy Spirit? Yes. <laughs> increase, increase, increase. Okay, why don't you turn to James chapter 4. We'll get there in a few minutes. But uh, we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Uh, we had a phenomenal, and I encourage you, if you can come out Wednesday nights, uh, we did the DVD uh, number one uh, the other night on intimacy with the Holy Spirit. It was great teaching, very, uh, very good. Um, when I get an email from my mom and dad saying that was really good, I go, yep, okay, that was really good. Um, <laughs> It was great teaching. I'd like to almost show it on a Sunday morning. It was just powerful. We're going to do DVD number two. So on Wednesday nights, if you're not working from 3 to 11, be here. Kids aren't in school and all that stuff, and uh, it's really good teaching. And um, one thing is I've been listening to uh, different um, sermons, lessons, and comments over the last while. Uh, One thing that's been on my heart is the church has done a very poor job of presenting who God is. We have become known, in fact, if you take surveys and all the surveys they've been taken, show that people don't like people in church, they don't like Christians, and they don't like God. And when you're asked them why they don't like church and why they don't like Christians, judgmental Mm -hmm. and harsh are two of the things that come up immediately. We have changed God from being one who loves and cares for his people into one who just sits around and judges. But that is not the God of heaven. If you've read the Word of God, especially the Old Testament, I kind of grew up believing the Old Testament. He was kind of sitting there waiting to hit you over the head with a wooden spoon that my mom often brought out, mostly for my brother because it wasn't for me. But, um, But that's not the God of heaven. How many times over and over again did he say, go and tell them again, go and tell them again, and demonstrate my love to them? And Jesus Christ did not come. Here's a thought for you. Jesus Christ did not come to eliminate people from heaven. There's a lot of people out there saying, you're not going to heaven and you're not going to heaven and you're not going to heaven and you're a sinner because you've got this sin. You're a sinner. Oh, yeah. Why don't we just start there? We're all sinners. And I don't care what you've done and I don't care what you're doing now. We are all sinners and Jesus came for us. And he came for you. He has not eliminated anybody. He made a way for everyone to feel welcome. He made a way for everyone to feel included. But it's the church who sometimes stands by and says, you're going to be excluded. You're not going to make it. You're not worthy. Show me that where that is in the Bible. Jesus came and brought a gospel that included everybody. Didn't leave anyone else. Gives everyone a chance to accept him as their savior. We will all be given a choice. Some may choose no, but a lot of people are going to choose yes. Um, I was watching some of the Hillsong's conference this week. I told you last week I recorded some of the services. I'd like to order the one with John Maxwell. You can go on YouTube and look it up. It's on there. Um, But he was talking about being salt and light, and he had some very interesting things to say about the church, how people do not go to church anymore. You need to have them into your house. It's almost like the alpha group kind of mentality. He says, you need to learn just have a round table and allow people to talk. And he was talking about he's known for his leadership right now, his leadership uh, skills. He does them all over the world. And he says, I've learned one thing. If you tell people that I have a secret, but you won't like it, he says, but they'll ask. Well, what's your secret? Well, I can't tell you. You, you, You're not ready for it. Well, what is it? Well, I, I can't tell you. And if you're anything like my wife, she becomes like a cat. Well, what is it? 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 The inquiring mind just, it's my way of tormenting Patty. I'll say, by the way, I know something. And then I'll just walk out the door. (laughs) I don't win often, but I try and win once in a while. But he's learned that after a while, they become so inquiring that they'll just, well, what is it? And finally he says, well, I'll tell you. It's my faith. Your faith, that makes a difference? It makes a difference? Well, let me tell you. We need to be better baiters of the hook, if you will. And Jesus was awesome at that. Signs and wonders are not just for the Bible. They are not for history. They are now. You can go online and watch them happening now, in the last week, in the last few days, in the last few months. 
God is still moving. He's alive. He's real. He is a God of miracles. And the name of Jesus still causes miracles to happen. The name of Jesus causes situations to change. The name of Jesus, there is power in the blood. And he is alive and he is well. And the good news is we are not alone here on the planet Earth. Jesus left, and I know a lot of churches preach this, but we are all alone now. No, we're not. And on Wednesday night as he went through, I thought it was powerful. Step by step, scripture by scripture. I believe it was six times in the book of Acts alone where the Holy Spirit, they were saved, baptized in water, filled with the Spirit. Saved, baptized in water, filled with the Holy Spirit over and over again, step by step. And a lot of us know this, but sometimes it's good to, be, good to refu- refresh it, review it. Because we tend to forget that the Holy Spirit is here now. He's here for us and to change us and to help us. Jesus said, just like me, there's going to be one who comes, a helper. He'll be just like me. He's part of my family. He's part of, part of the heritage, part of what we have. The Holy Spirit is our helper and he is not limited in any way. I'm going to say a phrase that's going to probably blow you up in a few minutes but we'll get to it but the holy spirit is a part of god part of the trinity he is able to release a power that comes on you and in you and works through you it's a power to help others a power to heal to allow situations to change lives to change families to change situations to change pads to get poured and most of all the holy spirit will allow us to come face to face with the living god Dynamite power, a power to save a life. Yes. Even one who has just died. I remember, um, I love that, these many stories of David Hogan. Um, last I'd heard he was at 73, then it's 85. I don't know how many people he's raised from the dead. But uh, the first one sort of happened in, in Montreal, I believe. And there had been a terrible car accident. A man died. And he ran over and said, what can I do? The police officer says, nothing. They're dead. And he said, well, can I pray for him? And he goes, you know, whatever. When the ambulance gets there, all of a sudden there's life. The police officers are going, how did that happen? What's going on? There is life and there is power in the name of Jesus. A power that allows people to declare, my God is real. The name of Jesus is real and powerful. In the name of Jesus, things will change. Folks, it's not over. We're not done. Prophetic words are being released even now about something that's about to be released. And I believe we are... Man, we are on the precipice. We're right there. God is breaking out in his church. And you know what? Uh, Jane's talked about it. Jason's talked about it. I think Jeremy, one of his testimonies. And again, the other night, we worked through. We saw and we heard. We've seen and we've heard. We saw and we heard. We've seen and we've heard. The gospel is about seeing and hearing what God is doing. Seeing and hearing what he's doing in your life. Seeing and hearing what he's doing in the hospitals. Seeing and hearing what he's doing in your government. Jesus brings change. Yes. Amen? Amen? I was reading through some scriptures yesterday, and I, I was hoping to go there, but I'm just going to read it just to throw it out there because I can't go there. I parked there for a long time. But in Luke 23, verse 8, you can just write it down if you want to look at it later. When Herod saw Jesus, he was really excited And it says that he desired to see him for a long time because he had heard so many wonderful things about him that he wanted to ask ask him some questions. And he hoped that he would see some miracles. Isn't that really cool? I'd love to go spend some time with Mark Hall. I've heard about Mark Hall. I've heard people get saved. I hear people get delivered. I hear things happen. I'm so excited I get to hear him. That's what Herod said when he saw Jesus. He had heard of him. Getting back to the Holy Spirit. The teaching has been powerful. And I just want to encourage you. Wednesday night, come on out. And as a church, we need to be reminded. We need the Holy Spirit. He is in us. He wants to be all over us. He wants to baptize us. He wants to just flow through us. And he wants our nation to be changed. And he wants your family to be changed. He wants his church to be changed, the city to be changed, yes. your workplace to be changed. We need the Holy Spirit and his power and his life. Yes. James chapter 4. I think I asked you to turn to James. James chapter 4. 
One of the principles John Bevere started off with the other night was this verse, James chapter 4, verse 8. A familiar piece of scripture, but again, like I said, sometimes it's just a good memory, reminder. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God. Who moves first? We do. How many people have been, and don't raise your hands, okay? (laughs) Rhetorical question inside. But how many of you over the years have said, man, I just want more of God. But we don't move. There's an action required in our heart, in our spirit, in our intent. We got a prophetic word from this, this morning from someone who just felt encouraged. We're to move toward God. If you want more of God, draw to him. Move toward him. Initiate action toward him. Let your heart be moved and stirred for him. Draw near to me. Show an interest in him. When you started dating someone and you called them and said, I'm really attracted to you. I'd really like to go out with you sometime. Uh, Okay, when do you want to go out? I'll get back to you. That's not showing much hunger. (laughs) That's not showing much passion. And if you put her on delay more than once or twice, you're toast. In fact, you're in trouble. You're probably in trouble in the first time. Draw near. Be interested in him. Be interested in interaction with him. Be interested in what God is doing and saying and wants to do. Draw near to him. The Spirit of God wants to speak to you. The Spirit of God wants to uh, have a relationship with you. The Spirit of God wants to be intimate with you. You have to move toward him. Two couples can't produce if they don't move toward one another. Can't have a baby. You just keep sitting beside one another. Someone has to initiate some action. Someone has to move towards someone. Someone has to have a passion to move to see some things happen. And the Holy Spirit wants to move and see some things happen in our lives. Let's turn to the book of John. Chapter 16. John chapter 16, verse 7. This is Jesus speaking. If you've got the red letter edition, it's all lit up here. Nevertheless, I'm telling you, says Jesus, I'm telling you the truth. It is to your advantage. It is better for you. It's good for you if I go away. Well, that doesn't make sense, does it? Jesus, the Son of God, says it's better for you if I go away. The one who heals, one people have been getting saved. Everyone who came to Jesus was healed. But it's better if I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, he can't come to you. But if I depart, I send him to you. Verse 13. However, when he comes, the spirit of truth has come. He will guide you in all truth. Look at this part. I love this few words here. He will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, that he will speak. And he would tell you things to come. He would tell you things about your life. He would tell you things about that are going to happen to you. But I want you to see something here. And here's a comment that's going to probably spin some of you for a moment. When Jesus was on earth, he was limited in his ministry. He was God, but he was limited. Well, how does that happen? Jesus was limited here on earth because he lived in a human body. He had to take time to eat. If he hung around George and I, he'd probably lose one to two hours a day. I wasn't going there. (laughs) Jesus took time to sleep because he grew tired. The word even says he grew tired. When you wanted to meet with Jesus, if Mark was Jesus, for example, and I'm walking up, well, all of a sudden, Peter's here. Oh, great, Peter's here. He talks forever. 
And then Mary Magdalene wants to have a word. And then all jeepers, here comes Doubting Thomas. He's going to have one of those questions. Oh, here, look out. Here comes James, the son of thunder. He's just going to let her boom. You had to wait your turn to speak to Jesus. If he went to Judea and you were still in Samaria, you had to wait for him to come back or get on a boat or a donkey and go over and see him. You could not talk to Jesus because you sometimes had to wait for others. Or maybe he was sleeping or maybe he was eating. That's why he said, it is better if I go away, I can send a helper to you. To you. Not to the earth, to you. Jesus came for all mankind. I've given you a son to save the world. But now he says, I'm going to send you a comforter for you and for you and for you and for you, all those who accept the Lord Jesus Christ. He, the helper of the Holy Spirit, does not sleep. He does not stop. He does not take time to have lunch. He can be in Africa. He can be in Canada. He can be in Zambia. He can be in the Arctic. He can be wherever you need him to be because you already have him with you. He is in you. He is on you. He is flowing through you. The Holy Spirit, the Comforter, has come to you. He is personal. He's all over the world. There's no longer any restrictions. If I want to go talk to Jesus, I don't have to worry about that Jeremy's got a a phone line into him, a prayer request. I don't have to worry that Donna's talking to him. I don't have to worry that Teresa's talking to him. He can talk to all of us at the same time because he's in you. We have our own private red line to him. And he answers all the time. Crisis or not, all alone or not, he talks to us because he's in us and he's with us. I don't have to worry about those that are in front of me. The Holy Spirit of God, he lives in you, he resides in you, he is your answer. And the power of God that you need for whatever is coming is already in you to be released. You will never be left without the power of God because the helper has come for you. For you, individually, not for the world, for you, and for you, and for you. And that is awesome. Just that little phrasing, for I sent my son for the world. Now all of a sudden he's saying, I'm sending Jesus, the son of God, is saying, I'm sending him for you. What a difference. Oh, I don't have to get in line behind Charlene. She'll talk forever. I can just, I talk to him. I talked to him. Flip over to John chapter 14. I'm going to be doing uh, just a lot of scripture, repeating some of what, what we heard on Wednesday night, but uh, hearing some different stuff because I just, we're in a season where the Holy Spirit's being released and about to be released in a different fashion. And it's important that we understand what he's doing, where he's going, and what he wants to do in us. Amen? So you will never be without power. The Holy Spirit, the helper, is here. So this section here in chapter 14, Jesus is about ready to go to the cross. He's about ready to lay down his life. And in some of his final sessions, as he's doing more teaching, intimate teaching with the disciples, they're kind of disturbed by the words because he keeps talking about, I'm going away. I'm going away. And they're saying, where are you going? We want to go with you. Where are you going? Where are you going? I got to go away because I'm going to send someone better. What do you mean someone better? I'm going to send someone who can be with you. We want you with us. So in chapter 14, verse, uh, let's start at 14 to 18. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. That's a good reminder for us. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. Oh, well, I don't know if I always want to do that. Look at verse 16. And I will pray the Father... That he will give you another, notice that word, another, another the same kind, another the same family, another the same spirit. That I will give you another helper, that he may, where is he going to abide? With you. And the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because he neither sees him nor hears him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And then he's kind of reminding the boys, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Verse uh, chapter 15, just wherever you are, 15 and then verse 26. But when the helper comes, 
whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, and he will talk about me, testify me, and teach you about me. That's part of the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen? The teaching part. It is important that we realize and understand that the Holy Spirit is a person. He is a person. I've often made the mistake, and my wife will correct me because that's part of the wife's job description that somewhere showed up in the marriage contract. Boy, I'm going to be in trouble on this one. (laughs) Anyway, but there have been times I've said in the Holy Spirit and referred to him as an it. And I've actually had to apologize the next day because I I felt bad about that. But sometimes you just get language coming out and and you say it. But the Holy Spirit is not an it. He's not a wind. He's not a, a spirit blowing around. He's not a gust of air. He's not whatever we think. He's not an essence. He is a person. And we have a number of scriptures and I had to cut down to about three or four because you want to study the Holy Spirit, you will see there's emotions, you will see there's characteristics, you will learn a lot about the Holy Spirit. But I'm just going to kind of quickly do a summary this morning. But he is a person. And we can show this because a person has a will, a person has intelligence, and a person has emotions. And in the Word of God, which is the book of truth, given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ, often in the New Testament, the first four Gospels. So Jesus is talking at times. Paul records for us. The prophets record for us many traits of the Holy Spirit. So we're hearing it from God's Word, then we know it's true, right? That is the book of truth. So personality has a will. And there are personal pronouns that are used to describe him all through the Bible. But in 1 Corinthians 2 and 9, you can just jot these down because we're not going to go to them unless Jeremy is really quick. I'm not sure. I didn't give you a preview. So, Intelligence is ascribed to the Holy Spirit. But when God has revealed them to us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. How do we know his intelligence? He knows the deep things of God. Wouldn't you love to know the deep things of God? Aren't you glad every once in a while he whispers into your spirit or you're, or you're reading the scripture and all of a sudden he just drops a little nugget in your spirit. This is what this means. This is what this means. Yes. But he searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. See, we've received the spirit of God that we can know things and it's a free gift. He loves to dispel. He likes when we crawl up into his lap and he says, let me show you what this verse means. He loves to show you what, what he's speaking to your heart. He loves to speak to, you as, speak to us as sons and daughters who just want to come and sit on dad's knee and understand what he's saying. The Bible again tells us of his emotion. It says that we should strive together when we pray. Romans 15 and 30. And then in Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10, the prophet records, We can anger the Holy Spirit. Therefore, he turned to be their enemy and fought against them. They rebelled and they vexed the Holy Spirit and they turned and became rebels. You can anger. How do you anger a thing? You must anger a person, right? Another emotion shows up. We can grieve him. Ephesians 4.30. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Just proving to you, just giving you a quick summary. These are things that talk about the emotions of the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 13 verse 2. If anything today I want you to hear this. It's good news for us. George, it's good news for us. Vern, it's good news for us. The Holy Spirit still speaks. If we would be quiet long enough, he still speaks. I heard somebody make a comment, uh, I think it was last week, maybe two weeks ago, it was on one of those uh, shows I was watching, some of those sermons, and the the guy, uh, maybe it was John Bevere. I think it was John Bevere, and I think of it. He talked about when Jesus said, uh, pray, uh, pray unceasingly. And the Lord says, I can talk unceasingly too. Would you just listen? Yes. Would you come to me and ask? Right. 
and listen to what I have to say because as you pray, I can talk. As you pray, are you willing to draw nigh? Are you willing to come and ask me unceasingly? And I will speak wondrous things to you. I want to talk to you. I want to communicate to you. I want to show you the word of God and what it means and the revelations that are in it. The Holy Spirit still speaks. Acts 13 and 2. The Holy Spirit spoke to the leaders and said, Set Paul and Barnabas aside. See, these are personal traits of the Holy Spirit. He speaks. Sometimes it's hard to visualize the Holy Spirit speaking, but I think if we asked everyone to lift hands, I bet a lot of you have had the Holy Spirit speak to you. There are sometimes you get thoughts in your, your head. Where did that come from? Or there's things happening. You just, you know it's him. Turn to John chapter 16. Just flip over the page. John chapter 16. Verse 13. However, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he speaks, he will speak and he will tell you the things that have come. And this is one important note. If you're ever checking prophecy, if you're ever checking what somebody gives you a word, he will glorify me, Jesus. For he will take care of what is mine and declare it to you. There are certain things we can look at with prophetic words. How do they line up? Is it truth? Is it actual? First of all, does it glorify Jesus? There's some denominations and teaching out there we don't need jesus anymore ding 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 get away from that one they're on the loopy train he will guide you but not only that he will tell you what to speak i love it when uh, we're praying for people at the altar i mean it's funny I remember the one time, uh, I'll pick on Tammy because she's at the front here and I asked her to sit at the front. Um, But there are some times I just feel, okay, uh, I'm supposed to pray for Tammy and I'll call her up and she'll say, what what are you praying for me for? I don't know yet. So why am I here? Well, the Lord told me to pray for you. Well, what are you praying for? I don't know yet. And I'll go for a walk and come back. and, And the funny thing is sometimes I get it, but there's been once or twice I don't get it, but someone else will walk up, oh, you're here. See, we're a team. It says it's the body of Christ. Sometimes I like, I like it when we go, when there's two of us, when we go to talk to someone. David Elliott and I have done this a few times when we've been making elderly visits. Not elderly visits, but on behalf of the eldership. And you go to talk to someone. Didn't phrase that one right. <laughs> on the eldership. <laughs> But there are times when you go to talk to someone, it's good to have that second person, first of all, as a witness, but sometimes you stop, but someone else already has a thought. And you can tag team, and it's good, and it's strong, and it's powerful. We don't always have the answers. When I used to lead worship, and even nowadays, the odd time when I get asked still to go and talk to worship teams, one of the things I learned is when I sense a change in the spirit, but I didn't have the song, I would wait. Because sometimes my, my piano player got it. Sometimes my guitar player got it. Sometimes somebody in the mic would all of a sudden start in on a chorus. And immediately when they would start in, I'd go, that's it. <laughs> Off we go. Body ministry means giving room to allow people to move and to flow. Sometimes they'll be right. Sometimes they'll be wrong. But you know what? When your kids started walking, they didn't walk straight line all the time. Neither did you. Let's give room to, for people to grow. So Jesus said here, he's promising the Holy Spirit, and he refers to him as the helper, as the paraclete, which means someone who will stand with you, someone who will speak on your behalf. Often it's a legal term. You're standing in the court of of heaven, and and the Father says, Charlene, there is sin against you. And he, no, no, that's been wiped away. Nope, that's been taken care of. I was taken care of at the cross. What about this? Well, nope, that's been done too. Well, there's someone standing over there accusing it. Yeah, I know. He needs to go. He needs to go. We have an advocate. We have someone who speaks for us. Who's, and one of the descriptions is he stands with us. The other one is he stands for us. And the other one is says he will speak for us. You know what? Be quiet and let him talk. Paraclete. He stands alongside now, you need to remember, Jesus did it all. He, every person who came to him and asked to be healed was healed. 
Every person he encountered who was dead, he raised from the dead. Jesus did it all, but he was limited. But that's why he said, it's better if I go away because now it's going to be all over the world. That's why Jesus said, greater things will you do. It doesn't mean that it's going to be greater power. It means greater in number. The whole world should be shaken with the church of God flowing in the power of God. They gained a trust in Jesus. Sometimes some people get trustworthy of their pastors. Well, pastor can do this. Pastor can do this. This is the way the disciples were with Jesus. Oh, Jesus can handle it. What do we need? We don't need to worry. Jesus was awesome to have around. He handled all the problems. They never had to worry when Jesus was there. The Pharisees would show up and answer those kind of, ask those kind of twisted questions. Um, Jesus, take this one, will you? It's time to pay taxes. Oh, man, what are we going to do? Go catch a fish. Oh, okay. We're out in a storm. Oh, Mark, what are we going to do? I don't know. Ken, what are we going to do? I don't know what to do. Well, let's go get Jesus. And he speaks to the storm. All along, they had learned to rely on him. All along, they had learned to trust on him. All along, they had learned that Jesus could handle all their situations. But you know what? It's like with your kids. I'm going to teach my grandson sometime this summer, or Joel. Maybe I'll stand there and watch. But we're going to teach Canaan how to ride a bike. But sooner or later, when you run along with the kids from what I remember, sooner or later, you have to kind of gently let them go. And that's what Jesus does with us. As we're growing as Christians, he's given us the Holy Spirit to empower us, to teach us to, how to walk, how to ride, how to run, all in him. And when we face situations, we don't need to turn to Jesus. The helper is already here. The power is already here. His love is already here. Speak the word and let it go. That's right. Let love speak. Let power speak. The words that he said troubled them. I will leave you, but I won't leave you alone. I won't leave you without comfort. Verse 18, we had read earlier, I won't leave you as orphans. You're still in my family. You're still anointed, but I'm going to give you another. I'm going to give you another who you can have a personal relationship with. I'm going to give someone who can help you in all situations. And basically what he's saying is, I helped you in some of those situations, but I have someone coming who's going to help everyone in every situation. Where I couldn't have been there before for Ken when he's over in Indiana and Iowa and wherever else he goes, I can still help Tammy while she's in London, and I can help Ken while he's on the other side of the border. I can help George when he's in Africa, even though his family's back in Canada. I can help Lauren when he's out fishing, even though David's sitting at home. We can help us wherever we are. This morning as we kind of get ready to close, we're going to pray this morning that the Lord is going to give you such a deeper hunger for the Holy Spirit, a thirsting for his presence. I want us to go to the next level. I want us to go deeper. And I don't know about you, but I'm hearing these reports and I don't want to miss anything. I don't want to read a report. I remember somebody saying once, if you're reading a report, it means you're not involved. I don't want to read a report. I want want to write my own. I want to write my own. This is what the Lord did. Look what the Lord did here. Look what the Lord did there. Testimonies are great. They encourage us. They're powerful. That's often what's kicked off lately with some of these services. What's often kicked off the move of God has been sharing a testimonies and then boom, off they go. Because faith arises in the house. We thank God for everything he's doing, but I need you and I need myself We need to desire to come into that deep personal walk and intimate relationship with him. Where your life is absolutely transformed. TV means nothing. These other activities mean nothing. I just want to spend some time with the Lord. I want to read some more of some good books. I want to read some more of the good book. I want to spend some time with worship. So it's my desire this morning. It's my prayer for you this morning. It's my prayer for me this morning that we would have a fresh awakening of the Holy Spirit and we would move into that relationship. I pray this week, even as you're at home, there's some things you're going to go, I don't know if I want to do that anymore. I pray there's going to be some things just, I don't, I don't want that anymore. My, my appetite for that is gone. And I pray that you'll be bathed, covered, and baptized in his presence. I pray that you will allow him to conform you. 
I like what Dad said about water baptism in Sunday school. Mark was teaching on it. And uh, you, there's a baptism of salvation or John's baptism, if you will. And then there's a baptism into Jesus Christ where you're baptized in the water. But I like what Dad said. He said, really what you're doing is sign a covenant, a contract. I am committing myself to be yours. Yes. And I want to be like yours. Right. And I want you in my life. And I'm agreeing to walk with you. And then the Holy Spirit will come and give you even more of what you need. You cannot live in this world nowadays without the power of the Holy Spirit. It is an evil place. But you know what? What a greater place for the light of Jesus to shine. In darkness, the light is is brighter. In the desert, there's a greater need for the living water. In the dry places, the places where there's been no food, no sustenance, What a better place for the living bread to come to life. So in a moment, we're going to pray. I'm going to ask George if he would pray for us. I want you to just close your eyes for a moment. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is better for you. It's to your advantage if I go away. Because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And he will guide you in all truths. And he will speak on your behalf. And he will be on you. And he will be in you. Let's pray, George. Well, folks, he's here. If you want to come to the altar, you can come to the altar. But you know what? Um, I think this is something you probably need to do at home. And the only reason I say that is it's easy to come to the altar at church. And if you need to and you want to, I mean, I'm not stopping you. I, I just really sense... God right here right now but we can make commitments at church all the time but it's at home you're in church if you're lucky four hours a week but you're home 56 to 70 hours a week you work 40 to 50 hours a week those are the places you need to make changes but you can only change those when you're at home in your prayer closet at home when you feel the urging of the spirit when you're sitting in front of the TV just uh, I need to turn it off I need to go and whatever it is so I'm going to challenge you I'm going to uh, Linda's going to remind me I'm going to send some of these verses out to you tomorrow if not today 
and um, this is between you and God. All I can do is preach what he lays on my heart. But if you want to see revival in the last days, and if you want to see change in your own life, you can't do the same thing over and over again. It's time for change. And that takes place in your heart and between you and God. So today or tomorrow or sometime this week, but it's quicker the better. You want to just review some of the scriptures in John chapter 14 and 15 and 16. James 4 and 8. Just read them over in your heart. Why don't you ask a dangerous question? Why don't you ask the Holy Spirit, what do I need to change in my life? But don't ask if you're not going to do it. It's sort of like saying to a loved one, what do you want me to do? And then walking away. But our church needs change. I need change. Our city needs change. Tonight we're praying for our government. Why don't you meditate on what the Holy Spirit is saying and doing to you? So you're dismissed. If you can go quietly, just talk out in the foyer. Those who may want to hang back a bit, but I would really encourage you. Review things at home. Ask the Holy Spirit some things at home and make changes at home because they will affect what happens here. Amen. So if you want to go, you're dismissed. And if you want to stay for a while, we'll have some music on that you can just think on and hope to see some of you back tonight at 7, if you can make it. But I hope you were challenged.